Welcome everyone. I'm Jennifer Ford from the League of Women Voters of the Elgin area. This is part of our continuing series on issues that we offer every second Wednesday of the month uh, at seven o'clock. We do it uh, as a Zoom and we do it uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've done some really interesting informative programs in the last few months. We've done sex trafficking and reproductive rights and women in poverty and a lot more. So if you happen to have missed anything uh, earlier, you can always go back on YouTube and watch it again. Uh, now I would like to introduce Sandy Captain, who identifies herself as a Greeniac. Uh, Sandy is a member of the Sierra Club. They have a local chapter called Valley of the Fox, and that's Sandy. She also serves on the board of the League of Women Voters of the Elgin area. So now she will introduce our speakers uh, and talk about our program, Start in Your Yard. There will be an opportunity for questions when we're all done. Sandy? I, I am a local Greeniac and totally obsessed with it, as my husband can tell you all about that if you ask him. Um, but I've spent a lot of time on climate investigations and rallies and, part, and all that kind of thing. But I was so excited to find out about the program tonight, Start in Your Yard, because it's a way to address climate change at, in your own yard each person doing their part. And two of my favorite people that introduced us to this at Elgin Green Groups, and they also presented at Sierra Club, are Jean Muntz and Nancy LaMaya. Uh, Jean Muntz and Nancy both, like many of us, have had several careers. Jean said she's been a nurse, an RN, taught childbirth classes, and started a plant business to supply plants to corporate places. Then she became curious about how the, um, the nature works and, and the, the, the gardening stuff and joined Wild Ones and the Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy was what got her into this, this train. And, and, and many of us are following a similar path. Nancy Lamaya, her partner and friend has had several careers also. She's been a teacher in District 300 a principal at U in U46, which she said she loved, and a data processing person before going with one of her favorite hobbies, which is birding to native plants and joining wild ones. And lo and behold, we have two people among others of us who are following what Doug Tallamy is saying, where we can do regenerative gardening, help solve climate change and help the birds and the plants and the bugs and the bees and everything at the same time. So please enjoy this program, start in your yard and get started. Dave and I have too. <laughs> well, hi everybody. I'm gonna share my screen here. Let's see if I can do it on a first try. Do you see my slides? Oh, not, yeah. Do you see my slides? Yes, yes you're good. Okay, good. <laughs> Well, we're awfully glad that you're having us this evening. We're happy to have an opportunity to share our initiative, Start in Your Yard, with you. Although I have a feeling that we may be speaking to the choir here this evening, that you are already thinking the same way we are. Uh, but we want to see whether we might come across some intersections between what fuels Damn. your passion and what calls us out into our yards. Now, beyond knowing the even-handedness of the League of Women Voters and your commitment to getting information to the people who need it, we're not sure how you choose legislation to work on. But today, we'll share our thinking about the importance of responding to the needs of our environment and point out a couple of issues that might be of interest to you. But just to get ahead of myself a little bit, I do want to say that one of the things we love about starting your yard is that it requires no legislative changes, no permits, no approvals. Uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy makes this point in his book that inspired Start in Your Yard, Nature's Best Hope, the blue one there with the bluebird. We even took our name from its subtitle, A New Approach to Conservation that Starts in Your Yard. Now, when we asked his permission to use it, he gave it with his customary enthusiasm. He's a key source of not just inspiration, but also information and ideas. 
you'll be hearing more about him as we proceed. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ideas that underlies Start in Your Yard, and then Jean will talk a bit more about the science and some uh, about garden design. So we'll start once again with the many crises we're facing. They're crises brought on not just by our use of fossil fuels, but also by the ways we've interrupted the life-sustaining systems that maintain Earth's balance. We count on these systems and yet ignore them when they come into conflict with what we want. We believe we can always outwit nature with our capacity for technological genius. Our species has come to believe that we can ignore what life has evolved over billions of years. As a teenage species, we're brash enough to think we know better than mother nature before we even realize that she's wise. The crises that have resulted have put us on notice. Headlines show us that the way we think about nature and about each other is not serving us well. That we need to re-examine what we've taken for granted. And what we've taken for granted is that our species, our place in the world is at the apex of a pyramid, the top of a hierarchy. We humans with a Western mindset have typically discounted, dismissed, disrespected all of life that is not us, all of life that is different from us. And here's one aspect of what we've done as a result. Over the centuries, we have destroyed the great majority of the natural systems that comprise the earth the prairies, forests, woodlands, wetlands, grasslands, rivers, streams, lakes, and oceans that once were home to huge populations of life in an astonishing diversity of forms that developed over the span of life's lifetime here on earth. We've improved it by installing lawns and cement that have destroyed the integrity of our waterways, We've introduced plants from lots of other countries, newcomers that can't provide the reciprocal relationships required for successful communities of plants and wildlife. We've created our idea of a pretty outdoor picture. We've replaced live habitat that nurtures wildness, that brims with life, with this dead-like replacement that supports almost no life at all. We've smoothed and controlled, contained, regulated, and isolated. Wild communities are unknown where we live. In fact, we've tried to make our outdoors more like our indoors, with neat and tidy lawns free of anything that annoys us. And this vapid sameness helps disconnect us from large, alive life. But we're discovering that living without wild neighbors, trees and plants, birds and bees, is not healthy for us. We're beginning to understand that as we got neater and neater in our neighborhoods, we got rid of things we didn't understand. Plant roots and fungi that would keep our water clear and healthy. Plant communities that would keep our air safe to breathe wildness that would shelter and feed insects and plants, wildness that calms and soothes us because it is our heritage. Now there are indigenous people who understand our relationship to the rest of creation differently. In 2017, the Wanganui River became the first waterway in the world to get legal personhood the third longest river in New Zealand can now be represented in court and has two guardians to speak on its behalf. People who view themselves as part of nature, who see their role as steward, whose way of life is intricately entwined with rivers and mountains, plants and animals. These people are using this tactic to try to preserve the ecologies that are at the center of their lives. 
Ecuador in 2008 was the first to enshrine the rights of mother nature in its constitution, followed by Bolivia with its mother earth law. And a year ago in Canada, a regional council adopted resolutions granting the Magpie River nine legal rights. Among them are the right to flow, the right to maintain biodiversity and the right to take legal action. Now the rights quoted here are not people's rights to have clean water or to enjoy unobstructed waterways. Rather, they enshrine the notion that wild beings, natural formations exist for their own purposes, just as we do. They reflect the second view drawn here, a perspective in which we are not the top dog of life, but part of all of life. It's a profound difference with profound consequences for every relationship we're part of. Changing how we see our place in the web of life means that we come to regard everything differently. We begin to understand that rivers and oceans are the lifeblood of our planet. We want to protect the lungs of our earth. We come to admire and imitate the way nature wastes nothing. We begin to appreciate how nature produces beauty in such abundance to no purpose other than its own. And with this change in our thinking about who we are, what matters is different. What we do is different. And how can we change to do in ways that will make a real difference? How can we change what we do in ways that will make a real difference? Well, we can begin by getting to know our would-be neighbors, the plants that could contribute so much by living in our yards. Now, like getting to know any new neighbor, we learn their names, who's related to whom, what they're good at, why they like living here, what they can teach us and what they can do for us, as well as what we can do for them. Start in your yard is helping to make introductions. We're planting native plants so people can see them. We're singing their praises and rehabilitating their names, which so often include the word weed. The artist Liz Anna Kozik draws our condition in her booklet, Plant Blindness. Green plants all look the same to so many and few understand that they're not interchangeable. Peter Forbes of the Center for Whole Communities has said that we in our consumption driven world can recognize a thousand product brands but cannot name 10 plants native to where we live. Now, typically we know the names of that which we value Getting acquainted with our native plants and birds and bees, caterpillars and butterflies, that moves us in the direction of understanding and caring about their fate, caring about the impact we make on the land where we could make a home for them, which would benefit all of us because when we do make room for wildness in our lives, our hearts respond. There's a spark within each of us that resonates with what we've lost in the fracturing of our world, a spark that ignites when we expose ourselves to life that blooms, reproduces, nurtures, and thrives beyond our control. But instead of living with wild life that shows us something new every time we look, We've covered our neighborhoods and public spaces with turf grass. We've fallen in line with our neighbors. We've listened to the advertisers and we've gardened with an eye to what meets the current aesthetic standard. There've been very few speaking up for the natural world, pointing out the importance of how we use the land in our neighborhoods. 
But one who has is Dr. Doug Tallamy, whom I mentioned earlier. His book, Nature's Best Hope, not only explains why we need wildness in our yards, but also gives us an idea for how to do it. He advocates replacing half our grassy lawn with native plants. Now you might be thinking, ah, that doesn't sound like much, that can't be very important, can't make much of a difference. But he points out that we have 40 million acres of lawn in our country. If you and I and everyone else were to make this change, it would create 20 million acres of habitat, 20 million acres of food and shelter for hungry critters. We'd create the largest national park in our country, bigger than our 13 largest national parks, including, oops, Yellowstone, Grand uh, Denali, the Tetons, Grand Canyon, the Everglades, Yosemite, and the Smokies, all combined. So Start in Your Yard asks, how can we turn people on to the fun of living with wildness right outside our doors? Living in Doug Tallamy's homegrown national park. Who and what can we coax back into our neighborhoods to live with us so that when we go outside, there's always something really interesting to see if we look, just like in a national park. Typically, our attention is elsewhere, cycling through our busyness, our worries, what's for dinner. If our attention finally does focus on the plants around us, there are surprises. For me, taking up the hobby of birding is what turned my attention to the plants in my yard. Of course, in watching birds, I began reading about them, and I found that species after species is in trouble because the habitat they need to feed, shelter, and reproduce is shrinking. You may have seen this shocking statistic. Or this one. Well, when I began to look at the plants on my property, I discovered to my horror that the wonderful hedge that was a critical factor in purchasing my house was Buckthorn, a very invasive plant that wreaks havoc where we live. My hedge comprised 100% buckthorn, plants that not only couldn't feed the birds, but also produced berries that are poisonous for them. I was complicit. Well, I'm sure you've guessed the outcome of this story, given that I'm here tonight on behalf of Start in Your Yard. I did, of course. The buckthorn that had seemed so appealing before I knew of its effects causes great damage to our forest preserves and other natural areas. And the seeds from my hedge contributed to, the, to that destruction. Buckthorn outcompetes the shrubs and trees that occur here naturally. So you might ask, well, isn't it a better plant then if it thrives and displaces the plants that are native here? Well, another myth about nature is that everything's all about competition. What we're discovering is a fuller and more complex understanding. We're learning that competition and cooperation, reciprocity and balance are nature's watchwords. Well, there's no reciprocity or balance with buckthorn. It arrived without predators to balance its growth or partners to profit from its growth. It grows unchecked without contributing to the community. It unbalances the whole. Vast amounts of effort are required to clear it so that natural communities can reestablish themselves. Communities that do cooperate and compete in order to thrive. Calorie pear is now clogging our woodlands and there are many others in addition to the ones shown here. Now, in case this topic interests you, I've listed some resources you can find on our website, startinyouryard.com. Controlling invasives is a facet where legislation can play a part. Now, actually, this is an auspicious time to be talking about invasives because last week was National Invasive Species Awareness Week. 
If we are to stop neglecting our heritage, we need to be stewards of the land where we live. We need to tend our environment in ways that are about more than neatness and adherence to old standards that are rooted in outmoded ideas. Buckthorn and honeysuckle are such a widespread destructive problem that it's illegal to sell them in Illinois. They leaf out earlier than our natives do and buckthorn even exudes enzymes into the soil that impedes the growth of their neighbors. You can see how these plants clog the woodlands that would normally be open and boast diversity in its native plant life. In fact, this kind of invasive dense understory growth is so widespread that many of us don't even realize that it's not normal for wooded areas to have this suffocated look. Over the last couple of decades, as we've followed Doug Tallamy's work, we've come to understand that the impact of these introduced species is even more complex and more profound than we'd realized. Dr. Tallamy is an entomologist. He studies insects, the very bugs that so many people think we'd be better off without. His research, writing, and teaching have helped us understand that there are highly evolved relationships between native plants and the insects that live with them. Simply put, plants don't want to be eaten, so they've developed ways to survive the insects that want to eat them. And they're very successful. Some are tough to choose. They smell or taste really bad or have hairy leaves. Some make whoever eats them sick. They have lots of strategies. But over thousands of years, particular insects have learned to eat particular plants. Many insects have adapted to eating only one kind of plant. They're called specialists. And the monarch butterfly is a famous example. Monarch caterpillars are specialists. They eat only milkweed. And without milkweed to lay their eggs on, monarchs are doomed. Milkweed is critical to their survival. From people's perspective, milkweed plants have been regarded as weeds. It's right in their name. People thought it was okay to get rid of it. What happened? The monarchs began to disappear too. Monarchs must have milkweed to feed their caterpillars. So as it disappeared, so too did the monarchs. Now there are insects that can eat more than just one family of plants and they're called generalists. These insects can use a wider variety of food sources, but not so many as you might think. The most general generalists can feed on only a small assortment of the many plant families that are native here. Even our generalists are very specialized. Insects can't eat just any old plant. So without the kind of plant it can eat, an insect is doomed because it would take so long for an insect species to adapt itself to change enough that it can feed on a different kind of plant. Our birds must have insects to survive. Insects must have plants they can eat, but they can't eat the grass in our lawns. They can't eat plants that we brought in from far away. And in most of our yards, that's all there is, a grassy lawn, with some plants, shrubs, and trees that developed with other insects in another part of the world. Our plant blindness prevents us from recognizing which plants host the insects that feed the birds that sing us awake in the summer. Our plant blindness prevents us from recognizing the plants that are complicit in destroying habitat. Our affliction blinds us to the difference between a merely decorative plant and one that hosts the fauna that we've so widely displaced. But as we come to understand more about our society's impact, the ways we're destroying nature's bounty, we find we want to change the nature of our own impact. So we say, Start in your yard, grab a spade, go outside. Do something important and lasting by changing the nature of your own impact on the land right where you live. 
And Start in Your Yard's aim is to help you do just that. In fact, you can go to startinyouryard.com and register your interest by clicking the purple button. You can sign up for a site visit. We'll come out and walk your property with you and talk about possibilities. People who plant native plants are bringing uniquely valuable gifts, gifts that have developed over millennia into their daily lives to create health and beauty right where they live. Our individual landscapes, particularly as they combine into living corridors, can be visually attractive like traditional gardens and also be part of the solutions to our mounting crises. We hope you'll help us build momentum by talking about what we're doing. More and more people are awakening to the fact that we need to work with nature instead of attempting to dominate her. We feel momentum building and momentum is what creates the kind of change we're holding in our hearts and minds. We hope you'll join in imagining this healthier, more beautiful, expanded world. And you have a standing invitation to startinyouryard.com for videos, links to information, inspiration, or to register your own interest in Start in Your Yard, and perhaps even request a site visit. And now, Jean. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> well, I think you can tell as members of the group called Wild Ones <clears throat> of Greater Cane, we are trying to change those old outdated ideas about how nature exists out there, somewhere else, separate from us, the public park, the forest preserve, the lakeshore, Yosemite. Coming before a group like you uh, allows us to talk about some of the ideas from Doug Ptolemy's book, as you've been hearing already. Um, the one we're most focused on is Nature's Best Hope, the blue book. But um, I became, uh, let me say that after I read the other book, Bringing Nature Home, um, <clears throat> I became more conscious of my role as a gardener. It was as though he was connecting dots about how all the other species are intended or designed really to work together for the ecosystem that supports me. The ecosystem that's my yard, my garden, my neighborhood. Truth is, the global climate crisis seems way too big to comprehend, but Doug Ptolemy brings it down to the grassroots level, pun intended. It dawned on me as a decision maker for my land that I carry a responsibility to do the right thing for my family, my neighbors, and the other creatures who share my land. The proper role for me is to steward, manage, protect, care for the species in my yard because conservation is possible right where I live. Species can be supported. And here was Doug Ptolemy reminding me, I didn't have to wait for governmental action. I could build a landscape that contributes rather than degrades. And this won't be a matter of depriving myself. It'll be indulging myself. I could renature my surrounds Maybe I've never been so empowered to become part of the solution. It was like tectonic plates shifting in me. Even though we are upright walking, tool using, carnivorous migratory species, we are still interbeings enmeshed in the great web of being with all other creatures. Nancy gave some background about the author being an entomologist and college professor. And I would add, he's a fabulous wildlife photographer, a homeowner, a gardener, someone who mows the lawn. And boy, does he like to count things. I mentioned this about him because he's very focused on lawns. And now you've heard about his intriguing idea to turn some 20 million acres of turf grass into the new homegrown national park. Well, biological wasteland is the term Dr. Ptolemy suggests 
best describes our biologically barren lawn. In his book, he declares that every square foot dedicated to grass is a square foot degrading our local ecosystem. What? I grew up thinking a lawn like this was something desirable. Look at that mowing pattern, like a plaid shirt. Here we see an example of what he reminds us is a monoculture crop, all one plant. Think for a moment how maintaining grass to look like this requires a significant amount of human time and energy, machinery to mow, gas to fill, gallons of water to keep the grass alive, pesticides and herbicides to kill stuff, and fertilizers to feed it. And when it rains here, our lawns are unable to absorb most of it. Grass is considered an impermeable surface, just like the sidewalk. 75% of rain on grass becomes runoff into our neighborhood sewers, streams, and into our beloved Fox River and beyond. Well, what's wrong with rain flowing into streams and rivers, you might ask? Aren't they meant to carry water? Right, but it's what's in that runoff, the gooky stuff, the pollutants, and the volume of that runoff that creates problems. I read recently, one quart of motor oil contaminates thousands of gallons of water. I thought you might like to see this map of Illinois watersheds. A watershed, by definition, is simply an area of land that drains into a receiving body of water. So if you look at our watershed and where we are up in the Elgin area, you see the purple line and it travels along, guess what? The Fox River to Morris, Illinois, where it joins the Illinois River. And then it goes down to near St. Louis, where it runs into the Mississippi. And of course, the Mississippi all the way to the Gulf, where we've heard about dead zones and other problems in the Gulf. Well, to start with, any of us can watch our neighborhood's storm drain and keep it clear of debris. Excessive runoff is generated by impervious surfaces. Erosion of stream beds and riverbanks is generated by the volume of that runoff. There are things we can do right on our property to, uh, excuse me. There are things we can do right on our property to capture rain and prevent this runoff. Nine area artists were selected to create storm drain art to call attention to some of these issues here in Elgin. See these two great examples? They, there are about 30 painted storm drains around Elgin and you can find a, a map of them on the uh, city of Elgin site. Find out where they are and go see them. The big blue octopus says it's not too late to save the planet. And the other, a monarch on a milkweed, says, use native plants to save the drain, start in your yard.com. And all this leads me to recall Elgin's attempt about 10 years ago to have us focus on the impermeable surfaces uh, and consider an assessment on them. Certainly an incentive to reduce impermeable surfaces, reducing the amount of grass would be a win-win for all. Unfortunately, some op opposed to this idea improperly nicknamed it the rain tax. Uh, anyway, the ongoing cleanup of Lake Erie is funded in part by passage of such assessments on impermeable surfaces in the municipalities around its perimeter. Today, incentives exist and money exists to assist Elgin homeowners to, who have issues of flooding, standing water, or desire rain gardens to capture runoff. And all these issues can uh, be addressed with, guess what? The use of native plants. Rain barrels, rain gardens, and bioswales would be some other things. The Swan neighborhood, Southwest area neighborhood, 
has about 20 bioswales that are all located on parkways in that area. In other words, we're talking about green infrastructure. If one lives on property with a stream, having a buffer of native plants, trees, shrubs that filter, infiltrate, cool, and cleanse that water, that rainwater, is keen, keenly important. Well, back to the grass for a minute. Dr. Ptolemy's research has found that despite all the attention we give to grass, the soil beneath it becomes depleted. He's calculated that 80 to 90% of an average residential yard is turf grass, leaving only 10 to 20% for trees, shrubs, and other plantings in depleted soil. To plant more native species, homeowners might be excited to know that their yard can become one small but vital piece of that homegrown national park we were talking about. There's actually a website and a way to register those efforts toward the homegrown national park. And Start in Your Yard stands ready to help. You can simply Google homegrown national park and you'll be led to that. The house on the lower right shows what's possible when those percentages are reversed. So 80% or more of that yard is green infrastructure, is, is greenery and natives. Dr. Ptolemy would call this a living landscape. And in fact, that's the name of one of his books. Wouldn't you describe it as I would as lush, layered, mysterious, I want to run up those steps and see what else is there. Inviting, abundant. Anyway, what makes native plants the right choice? And I love this chart. On the far left, you see our beloved lawn, turf grass. One answer is pretty apparent in this, in this diagram. It's all about those roots. Native plants create communities that thrive above and below the soil line. These are some of the native plants present in Elgin when the Kimball and Gifford families arrived to settle Elgin. These plants co-evolved over thousands of years with the, all the other native shrubs, trees, Insects, birds, reptiles, mammals, soil, climate, water, longitude, latitude of this area. Grass can't capture and store carbon or feed the soil, but natives can. Grass can't absorb enough rain to recharge our groundwater, but natives can. Grass can't feed the insects that feed the birds, but natives can. Plants can't remove toxins and neutralize heavy metals, but native plants can. And here we've mentioned the monarch butterfly whose larva, the caterpillar stage, is dependent on our native milkweed. And so you see Mr. Monarch uh, caterpillar on the left munching away. This kind of exclusive relationship, and Nancy talked about it, uh, is true for 90% of our native insects. By the way, um, when you look in the middle picture, we're looking at a bee there. Honeybees are not native to the United States, but there are 400 native bee species in Illinois. And here's one on the milkweed in the middle. No, not on the milkweed, on the goldenrod in the middle. And of those 400 native bee species, about a third of them need pollen exclusively. They don't specialize on nectar. You'll see bees on all kinds of flowers collecting nectar, but the species that are specialists need the, the pollen on the goldenrod. And the other bug on the, on the goldenrod is a goldenrod beetle. He's actually a predator, meaning he eats other bugs, but he's also a pollinator because he carries pollen. So we can be, and then on the third picture is our beloved oak tree. And Dr. Ptolemy, because he loves to count things, has discovered that the 
the our oak tree supports more than 500 species of just caterpillars. So <clears throat> we can begin to conclude that all plants are not equal when it comes to the role they play in a given ecosystem. In fact, Dr. Talame has identified what he calls keystone species that do way more than other native plants when it comes to contributing to the system. On the next slide, you'll see um, a bit about um, invasive species and Nancy's talked about that already. Here's a chart showing you uh, non-natives and native species. And again, it's all about the roots. And then we see the burning bush, we see the barberry, and here's my a picture of the calorie pear or the Bradford pear. And all those plants have gone rogue and all of them are still sold in nurseries. So that's one place we could begin to look at legislation maybe. So this leads me to ask who speaks for the native plants? Is it time we start thinking about gardening with a larger purpose in mind? Is it right to place a plant in my garden however I see fit without considering its needs and the needs of the ecosystem it is entering? Well, decades ago, Aldo Leopold, a, biolo a biologist from neighboring Wisconsin, and you've heard his, his name before, he explained it all so brilliantly. Land then is not merely soil. It's a fountain of energy flowing through a circuit of soil, plants, and animals. And I'm going to refer to this circuit as the biodynamic engine. When we remove the smothering grass and plant natives, we kickstart this biodynamic engine. Why am I showing you a photo of a bench? This simple style is known as an Aldo Leopold bench. And when you see one, it's a clue. It's often placed where native plants have been planted. Once it's turned on, this circuit, this biodynamic engine becomes its own regenerating system, sending down deep roots to drill compacted soil. You saw diagrams of the native plant roots. Uh, roots. We didn't mention how they participate in vast networks of communication and nutrient exchange via miles of strands of fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, running through, around, betwixt, and between these massive root systems. Some are calling this nature's internet or the wood-wise web. So fascinating. Well, here you see that above ground, plants take in carbon dioxide and their leaves are solar collectors, passing the sun's energy into the greater food web to insects, animals, birds. Think about how this allows everyone to eat the sun and have oxygen to breathe, of course. The circuit continues, never broken, because any waste generated in this system is nutrients for bacteria, microbes, and the soil. We can say waste becomes food for the hundreds of millions of microbes present in every teaspoon of soil. Here's our challenge with this approach. Can we change our standard of beauty from one of a manicured mode monoculture of grass to a yard described as filled with birdsong, buzzing with bees, swaying in the breeze, humming with activity, teeming with life? These descriptions are all evidence that we are re reconnecting with that circuit, that biodynamic engine, and it is at work. Connecting native plantings and mo with mode pathways and corridors might be a more reasonable way to use grass. Distinct edges help indicate to the uninitiated that this is a managed garden. 
we suggest you include a mowed area rug to throw a ball or play a game. And here come the bees, butterflies, moths, dragonflies, birds to feed, to lay eggs, to pupate, to pollinate. In a garden like this, their sheltered passageway, habitat, and food, it, and it's offered for all the other animals and species who need it. And for our feathered friends, a bird food factory in real time. There is a monarch here. Does anyone see it? You can tell me later. Let's transition from using great expanses of lawn. Let's realize the importance of green corridors for movement of animals, but also migration of native plant species. Let's recognize that what falls upon the land, such as leaves and rain, is intended to be a resource for the future of this garden. Let's understand the decisions we make affect the outcome for all who share the plot and live in this neighborhood. For instance, do we grind up or bag up the leaves for pickup when it means losing all the beneficial insects, the small mammals, and reptiles overwintering in those leaves? This kind of awareness would be the result of using more thoughtful landscape design practices and begin to reap long-term benefits immediately. It's one thing to say we can care about something, but the real work of the world is to care for it. Doug Ptolemy, along with his student research assistants, found that birds prefer to feed their babies mostly caterpillars. Here we see dad chickadee on the left. If we look at caterpillars the way birds do, we too might see a soft, squishy, nutrient-dense bag of baby bird food. This makes them easy to shove down the tender little throat without causing damage. Dr. Ptolemy and his assistants decided to count how many caterpillars it took for one chickadee couple to raise one nest, one clutch of babies. Well, it's thousands. They discovered it takes six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one clutch of babies to fledgling stage. Fledgling meaning out of the nest. Uh, and so you see mom on the left, she's feeding a baby out of the nest. She's feeding a crunchy seed and that baby can eat crispy beetles now as well. Dr. Ptolemy tells us that mom and dad feed them for two more weeks, but he and his students weren't able to continue counting once the chickadees were running around. Not surprising, he and his students have determined Caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other plant eater. And Sandy, I saw you had a question and we'll talk about that at the end. Here's the clincher. With this diversity of native plantings, the, same, the land becomes resilient, able to mitigate, let's use the word heal, the effects of ecological damage. And we humans get to know to reconnect to the plants and the animals that make up this integrated energetic and might I say sacred system. Can we begin to see how the native plants are not just for gardeners? They may be for everything but us. How we garden and who we garden for may become why we garden. Gardens matter. When we become part of the ecosystem, rather than living apart from it, we participate with nature and steward a yard we understand is shared with many. Using native plants leads us to think about landscapes with a deeper purpose. Our gardens matter because they can literally save species. They also heal us. Many of our medications come from plants like antibiotics from mold and fungi. Aspirin, cancer treatment drugs, heart medications. There have even been studies about how students in classrooms with trees outside the windows 
or hospital patients with a view of nature perform better. How gardening can be an antidepressant and even brief exposures to the natural world can produce measurable medical and social benefits. Wouldn't it be neat if the new indicator of status on the block had nothing to do with the greenest carpet of grass dependent upon water, et cetera? Rather, why couldn't it be about the neighbor who can brag that she's seen a rusty patch bumblebee on the Menarda fistulosa or has come upon a nesting humming, hummingbird in the nine bark, oops, I mean the Physocarpus opulifolius shrub, or enjoyed the company of Mr. Oriel, who perched on the chair while she planted her recently purchased flat of Carrick's gray eye. It will enrich our lives to become familiar with the native plants and their specialized relationships and their names the ones that do the important work for us and should in exchange receive our protection and care. There are voices summoning, even lighting the way for us. Doug Ptolemy reminds us, we all carry responsibility for stewardship of the earth. Let's shrink the problem into something manageable. Let's begin right where we live. And Charles Eisenstein in his book, Climate, A New Story, suggests, we can learn from our mistakes, mature in our gifts of what he calls hand and mind, and turn them to a different purpose. Instead of leave no trace, we have the chance to leave a beautiful trace or a healing trace. Robin Wall Kimmerer, the biologist, author, member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation assures us. The native plants will show us. Think of what we do to heal our yards as an act of reciprocity, of giving back, saying thanks for the gifts the plants and animals give us. And the earth will reciprocate with beauty, certainly, but also clean air, clean water, more resilient land right under our feet. Benjamin Vogt's book, A New Garden Ethic, opens me to the idea that how I garden might express a kind of justice for all living entities, wildlife justice, he calls it, for species marginalized or facing extinction, a compassionate activism taking place in my own yard. Richard Powers, the author of the novel Overstory, muses, quote, I've become interested in the humbling sciences, I guess I would say, that point our attention away from ourselves and onto other living things. And you know, amazement and wonder are very close to humility on my own emotional wheel. The more astonishing the world around us becomes, the more we have to share the limelight with these other things that are just mind boggling. And finally, all this leads me to think about the poet Mary Oliver who left behind her instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. So open the door, grab a trowel, and start in your yard. Thank you. Now, Sandy, I noticed you had a question about, you were asking what, our, what some of our favorite keystone plants are. Yes. And um, he's actually developed a, a website with the National Wildlife Foundation that you can go to. Um, you can uh, ask for the county you live in mm -hmm. and it'll tell you the major keystone plants of this area. And he has done it for the whole United States. And I was recently on that website and they've updated it a great deal since he started it last year. Um, and it gives some preliminary information from him and they use him as the authority, of course. So it's really fun to go and put in your own 
um, you know, county and in fact area code to was, get the plants. Kind of wondering what yours were. Um, and well, personally, mm -hmm. I love the butterfly weed, the tuber, the Asclepius tuberosa, which is the orange butterfly weed. And um, Dr. Talame was talking about that one day. He said he was at the High Line in New York City and he saw the butterfly weed there and, and covered with monarchs. And he said, wouldn't a better name for it be Monarch's Delight? We should really call it Monarch's Delight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And of course the oak, I mean, no one makes more food than the oak. Yeah. It, it's amazing. When I was a kid in Michigan, uh, we had maple trees um, and always, you know, we were always careful because, you know, there were caterpillars, I mean, and I didn't mess with them too much. I like to look at them, but um, I rarely see them now on our trees. Uh, it's just very unusual. Of course, the big thing, and one of the landscapers got away with murder in my yard, I consider it. I, they were doing a neighbor, a neighbor's yard and we went for a quick walk and I thought I'd be back in time to talk to them and they got ahead of me and up the tree. I don't like maple trees that look like whatever that is, elm or something. I want them to look like maple trees. But anyway, so it's harder to see something, of course, when it's trimmed up. But um, we do have some oak started in the backyard. So I'm going to watch for caterpillars. I want to see if I can see any. That's neat. What was the name of that Eisenstein book you talked about? I Yeah, Climate, A New Story, Charles Eisenstein. But Nancy, jump in too, because he's written um, three or four books that are really mind stretching on um, environmental thinking. I think it's so neat what you guys say about the philosophy and the emotional rewards, because I think that's what people are missing. You know, when you get out there and you do some of these things that, you know, it's, it sounds like a cliche, but there's just something about, of course, I grew up in a subdivision that had farms. My grandfather's farm, fruit and veggie farm was across the street, but Honestly, when you do gardening and flowers and trees and bushes and I don't know, there's something about getting your hands in the dirt. It just, it's therapy. It's really therapy. Mm -hmm. It's really great. And there, there was another question about ground covers. Yeah. Do you have our favorite, Nancy, would you like to chime in on some of your favorite ground covers? You're mute. mute. Yeah, she's muted. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the ground cover I'm going to mention, I planted because I went to the Doug Tallamy uh, National Wildlife Foundation site and discovered that native wild strawberry, believe oh. it or not, is one of our best hosts mm -hmm. for insects in this area. I was just stunned. And of course, I didn't have any, so I decided to plant some, and I'm sure it will be a great ground cover. It's just such a strong grower, uh, and of course, I've only had it for a year, so we aren't very well acquainted yet, but uh, over the next few years, I'm, I'm sure we'll know. One of my favorite plants, and it could be a ground cover, um, but I, I grow it everywhere it will grow, and that is the... Uh, uh, <laughs> prairie smoke that's what it is uh -huh. prairie smoke. <laughs> i've heard her GM, talk about that <laughs> yeah geom triflorum it's just a beautiful plant and it's uh it's green way way into the fall and it's already greening up now so it's a, a almost a three season plant really uh and it's just charming in its bloom charming in its seed stays very low, uh, spreads and covers ground. So I just have to give a shout out to that because I love it so much. But then, you know, there's so many of them to love. And then that's part of why it's, I'm so passionate about getting them out there where people can see them. We did a community read with the library last year and it was so much fun working with those people at the library. They're so wonderful to start with. 
But then they really picked up on what we were doing. And several times they said, oh, I was out and I saw such and such. Mm -hmm. And of course, they knew its name. Uh, they spotted it. They cared about the fact that they recognized it. And it's such a powerful thing as, as people begin to get acquainted. They're just such fabulous neighbors to have. Uh, but but we, we don't see them in the nurseries in bloom and so forth. And so we don't really get to know them in that way. And there aren't many other options. So, uh, yeah. I'm so glad to hear about that strawberry because for some reason, I, I'm scouring everything for ground covers for this area. Last year, I tried 80 little plants that I thought would make it. And of course, the drought and nothing did. Oh, that's and, hard. Uh, that was really hard because I wanted to do something that grows in the woods and you see this oh a partridge berry and another one they mm -hmm. didn't make it but then I came across just this this fall about that strawberry not no wait a minute I've got something that I thought was invasive but it's oh there is oh no, no no it is yeah it is yeah, there is yellow flower is the invasive but the white yeah. one is the yeah, one right there. right yeah yeah, I yeah. ordered them from wild ones, so I'm... I'm oh, good. Okay. <laughs> but one for the woodland that's a real strong grower, and I've been told will even out, uh, uh, will get rid of, like, what's the myrtle, the... Um, uh, the uh, yeah, periwinkle. Periwinkle. Or myrtle. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, that if you plant it next to it, it'll actually encroach upon it and, and help to get rid of it. So, and of course, it's just a beautiful carpet. Uh, uh, it has a lovely look. It, it does have a bloom, but it's down underneath the leaves, which is kind of charming. You have to go and look. To... You're talking about ginger. Isn't ginger. that what I said? I no. don't think you said. Oh, I didn't <laughs> say what it was. Oh. It's okay read my mind yeah you know. yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah it's uh, wow. a serum canadense sorry wild ginger, you mean right wild, wild ginger oh, okay mm -hmm. yeah I, that's so great. it was about the same time that the library had done their program that aaw also did a program of doug ptolemy's book um, of which i was totally ignorant knew nothing about this uh -huh. but i was one of those people who that year that all the microverse went through destroyed my yard took out every tree every plant my fence uh took out everything so i was starting with a blank canvas and luckily saw about the doug ptolemy book at the same time so i could start from scratch um and so i have been a missionary on this but I want to make sure that I don't say the wrong thing. So I think it was Jean. Did I misunderstand you? Or did you say that buckthorn and honeysuckle were outlawed in Illinois? They're illegal to sell. Oh, illegal to illegal sell. Illegal to sell them. I want to say the wrong thing. Yeah. yeah the, nurseries, the nurseries can't sell them. Is there one honeysuckle that is okay? Yeah, there is a native honeysuckle. Okay. okay. There's a little and, bush, honeysuckle, and also a vine. Sorry. I have a question that you folks wouldn't be required to know, but I have a feeling that you know. <laughs> um, talking about probably the city of Elgin, but any municipality, but since we live in Elgin, do municipalities have rules like what do they consider a nuisance weed yard that needs to be taken care of or a natural yard? Are there mm -hmm. parameters? Are there rules or is it just? Yeah, it's it's above a certain height. It, uh, I think and Sandy, maybe yeah. you can chime in I on would. this. It It's not a specific plant, but it's yeah. uh, above a certain height. And I, I think it my my friend from South Elgin came over to see our front yard. I said, "Oh, oh you're going to be in trouble." Well, the trouble <laughs> person is here, so we we escape. But we have like six and eight foot tall sunflowers, but that I got from the side of the yard. I I think they're okay. But um, Dave said, I guess the rules are if the I think it's over eight. Wait a minute, it's a certain number of feet. But if it looks like it's not in a in a in a flower bed, it's not legal. If it's just all over everything, it's not legal. Even though I really think it it should be myself, but that's the rules for in the city. Well, limit. if it's if it's a visibility issue at a corner, yeah. 
then, you know, oh, certainly. And, and because the Swan neighborhood has 20 plus bioswales in that neighborhood and they're all on the parkway, um, the code people, the code um, enforcers in the city are well aware of the issue of um, native plants versus weeds, yeah. you know, and when it's uh, a managed garden and it and it's a managed bioswale, um, you know, they're they're going to understand that. Um, although we do, we have heard that there is one bioswale over there that gets. Uh, cited every year because it's so close to the corner and has taller plants in it. But there's ways to address that. Yeah. yeah. So Jean and Nancy, oh, go ahead, Carol. Yeah. I was going to ask about the uh, the butterfly weed. I know the uh, Asclepias tuberosa, which is the orange flower that I love, mm -hmm. but it wants a sandier, drier soil. So mine has struggled. And I know there's a swamp milkweed, which is probably requiring more moisture. So is there a form of uh, butterfly weed that would be attractive to the butterflies and whatnot that is a bit better adapted to our clay type soils? I think there's five that are um, native in this area. So if you, and I, I can't remember all their names right now, but um, the, the one that's um, more for a wetland or uh, it, it enjoys wet feet occasionally is, um, Nancy, do you remember? Swamp milkweed, can't um, remember. It's called swamp milkweed is the common yeah. name. And it's similar to the butterfly weed. It's not quite as bushy looking and, and it has a bright fuchsia pink flower rather than the orange yeah. flower. And then there has the, to be one that would thrive with not swamp and not uh -huh. dry oh, yeah. sandy. Yeah. Something in between. Yeah. So the common common milkweed will thrive. Common, common milkweed, syriacha. I, I, think. I did have common milkweed the last few years. But it just got so tall and tended yeah. to flop because I had it on a sort of a hillside and yeah. it did quite well, but it would get to about four or five feet tall and then it would just kind of flop. Yeah. So I found yeah. myself staking it, which yes. was not at all the natural yeah. look I was going for. <laughs> right. right. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm looking for a better variety and no one seems to be able to recommend well, one. This past year, um, someone got in touch with us with purple milkweed. Now I hadn't even heard of purple milkweed, but uh, it's evidently a little shorter. Uh, and of course I haven't grown it myself yet, but uh, I, I gave a lot of it away and planted some myself. And I'm hoping that that's going to be one that's also fun to, to have around. So that might be something you'd want to check into. I can tell you who to get in touch with to get seed. <laughs> okay. As we're recording, I think we need to wind this up. So uh, Jean and Nancy, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm either going to have to do some more reading or I'll be calling one of you guys with my questions. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to invite everyone else to remember that the second Wednesday of the month, we always have a program at seven o'clock. Unfortunately, we haven't worked out the details for April, but for May, our topic is going to be mental health services in Elgin. So thank you, everybody. Join us again. Good night. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thanks, Jean and Nancy. Oh, love your stuff. Thank you.